Hello, hello. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy to see you. And uh, I know that the Lord has a word for you. Not because of myself, but because of his love that he has for you. We would all just bow our heads for a word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father God, how wonderful is it to be in your presence. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Father God, at this moment, hide me and hide everybody here behind your cross. Heavenly Father, exalt yourself and lift yourself up. Let no man be given the glory except for you, because only you, O Lord, are worthy to be praised. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. To tell you the truth, this is the first time I've been asked to give a testimony alongside a sermon. And so I thought, what testimony would be most fitting? And instead of giving you one testimony, there's going to be little testimonies here and there that fit with what I'm going to be discussing. First of all, I, I just want you all to understand I've been a Christian my whole life. And even more so than that, I've been a Seventh-day Adventist my whole life. I can remember paying attention to my first sermon when I was five years old. I remember we were in New York visiting my uncle, and uh, I'm sitting down in the pew, and this pastor was preaching. Now, me being five years old at the time, what I was trying to do was go to sleep. But this pastor was so loud, so loud. <laughs> I was actually getting annoyed. Like, I was waking up like, can you please stop screaming? Like, is it really that serious? But then eventually, five years old, something told me, you know what? If the pastor is so loud, why don't you just listen? Five years old. So for the first time being five years old, I sat down and I decided instead of going to sleep, I was going to listen to the pastor preach. And it makes me think a little bit about how when Jesus said, suffer not the little children to come unto me. Because we don't understand that even at a very young age, someone can come to accept Jesus Christ. And your life can be changed even then. And so at five years old, I heard a preacher preach about salvation. And I had a conviction that came into my heart. And when the, peace, when, the, when the preacher at the end of his sermon asked for the altar call, I was the first person to walk up. And I guess, yeah, it, it is kind of cute. You know? <laughs> oh my gosh, you're so cute. Look at him, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, um... <laughs> so uh, it's interesting that you would think that you would think that if someone made a decision for Christ at five years old, that their life should be a testament to that. You would think that if I made that much of a serious decision at such a young age, I wouldn't have made the mistakes that I've made in my life. But unfortunately, that was untrue. And yet still fortunately, the only reason why I have hope is because of my God. Yeah. If we can all please open our Bibles to the book of Jonah. Jonah. Here's good. a small book. Amen when you get there. Amen when you get there. Amen. Okay, okay. All the weights. Book of John. We're going to be starting with verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. Can I hear somebody please say against it? Yes. And cry out against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. 
He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea, to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had laid down, and was fast asleep. Now let's skip over to verse 11. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous, tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and took vows. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and took vows. Something I've come to learn in my walk with Christ is that you can be running away from Christ while bringing people to Christ. You can be sharing the gospel to people. A gospel that you don't even have. You can be drawing people closer to the king when you have your back turned to the king. Jonah was concerned with running away. And the mariners didn't even know who his God was. But Jonah during this time was able to witness to men who served false gods. Because before we read that the men were crying out to their gods. In verse 5, the Bible says, Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his god, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had laid down, and was fast asleep. So the men cried out to their own gods before because they didn't know who this new God was. They didn't know anything about this God that Jonah served. And so when they saw the storm was raging, they had to ask the question. In verse 8, please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. Many of us here are Christians today. Many of you are similar to me and have a similar story to me. And that we may have spent our lives in the church. We may have made a decision for God a long time ago. But I ask that you all examine yourselves at this moment and ask yourselves the question, have you truly given your life to God? Just because I come up preaching doesn't mean I've given my life to God. Just because I did Bible study doesn't mean I've given my life to God. Even if I do all good things that we can think a man could do. None of those things mean that I've given my life to God. Because salvation is something that's simple. Salvation is something that's easy. And those mariners, although they knew little, were saved. 
simply because they believed. So ask yourself at this moment, regardless of how long you've been on this journey, have you actually given yourself to Christ? You know, for myself personally, I believe that I've uh, run away from God in a couple of different ways and at different points in my life. One of those points was when I was, uh, when I was maybe 19, 20 years old. I started envying my friends. Because lots of my friends, you know, they used to go clubbing, my friends used to go drinking, talk to all these girls, and they stopped asking me to go out because they knew I'd tell them no. They knew on a Saturday night I'd tell them, Mrs. Sabbath, I'm not going out with you, etc. But then one day I just started wanting to have fun. I know I'm speaking to somebody right now. I know I'm speaking to somebody right now because sometimes you just want to have fun, right? You're, you're only young once, right? And you want to have fun with your friends like the way everybody else does. Why do I have to be cramped up in my room, Lord? Why can't I go out and do the same things I see my friends doing, Lord? They're just having fun. It's no big deal, Lord. And so I started going out with them. I started drinking with them. I started going partying with them. Until one day, you know, I was at uh, Caravana. <laughs> I just hope there was no pictures taken of me then. <laughs> but I um, went to Caravana and... Um, I remember uh, there was alcohol all in the room and, you know, we woke up and we ordered KFC to eat for breakfast. <laughs> the story keeps on getting worse and worse, right? Well, they kicked me off of the podium right now. We ordered KFC for breakfast and I remember one of my friends said, all right guys, let's get in the circle, you know, let's, uh, let's pray over the food. <laughs> And I was like, let's what? He said, well, there's food. We should pray over it. I was like, bro, don't you see the alcohol in the room? You know where I can If we pray, that means we have to leave. Like, what do you mean? And he said, well, I don't care what you do. I'm going to pray over the food. And this was the first time I realized. Did someone really just ask for something as simple as let's pray over the food? and I wasn't able to do it? Me, someone who had given my life to Christ when I was only five years old, I can't even pray over some chicken? <laughs> and I was like, this is ridiculous. And when I went home, I remember I sat down in my room, you know, and I examined my life. And I realized I was at the bottom of the barrel. And I had no clue how it was possible that I had fallen so far. Has anybody ever felt that way? Has anybody ever just realized that you reached a certain point where you're just like, who am I anymore? And I said, you know what, Lord? I'm done. I'm done living my way. I'm giving everything up to you. And this is a little irrelevant, but the first thing the Lord told me to do was to rip up my rap posters, to break my rap CDs, and to break some of my video games. Amen. But that's what the Lord told me to do. <laughs> because I decided to give my life to Christ. But now, Jonah, Jonah is a prophet. When God is calling Jonah, Jonah is at the level, if you will, of being a prophet. Let's just understand who Jonah was. A prophet of the Lord. But God knew that Jonah was holding on to something that he had to let go. 
Because the question that I ask myself sometimes when I think of the story of Jonah is why Jonah? Why not somebody else who would be more comfortable to speak to these people? Why pick Jonah? Brethren, it is impossible to follow God while holding on to the world. What I might be holding on to, or what I was holding on to, is not necessarily the same thing that you may be holding on to. But if you ask yourself right now, Lord God, if I'm to give myself to you 100% today, what do you want me to do? The first thing the Holy Spirit is telling you to do is to give up something. Amen? Amen. God is asking us each to give up something so that we can grab him with two hands because we can't grab onto God and still hold on to the world. Yes, sir. We can't do it. So Jonah had a struggle. And even though Jonah was good with his doctrine, Jonah did not understand the gospel. So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah knew who God was. Jonah knew his Bible was a man of God. But even at that stage, he did not understand the gospel. If you want to turn your Bibles, please, to 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8. I want to teach us what should be our first doctrine today. The first doctrine that we learn and that we accept as Christians. First John, not John, the John with the one in front of it. One John four, verses seven and eight. Amen when you get there. Amen. Okay, we're learning. Okay. I'm sorry. The Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. If we don't understand love, then we don't understand what it is to serve God. And we don't understand what God it is that we serve. Because as much as we might love the commandments, if we don't love our neighbor, we are not living out the gospel. Maybe some of you don't believe me. Let's turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 1 verses 5 to 7. Love. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 5 to 7. Now the purpose of the commandment. Now the purpose of the commandment is love. From a pure heart. From a good conscience. And from sincere faith. From which some having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. If we don't understand that the purpose, the whole reason why the commandment was created is for love, and we go to people talking about you need to keep the Sabbath, Not understanding that the reason why we keep the command, why, the reason why we keep the Sabbath is because of our love for God. It's because we want to remember Him on this day. It's because we want to remember that He saved us and we did not save Him. 
ourselves on this day. And so the purpose of that commandment is love. We go around and our talk is idle, the Bible says. And desiring to be teachers of the law, we will not understand the things that we're saying, nor the things that we're affirming. So God had to teach Jonah to love, because if you don't love even one person, something is missing, because God is love. Now for myself, I had to go through this too. I personally was, um, and I've never said this on the pulpit before, so please, please bear with me a second. Don't get scared, Pastor Chantel, it's not that bad. <laughs> I used to be very homophobic, and I believed Ashamedly, I say this, I believe that they should die. I hated them. Let me tell you the truth today. And one day, I was listening to a sermon about love, me and my Christian self, and my holy self. And for the first time in the sermon, I started to cry. And I didn't understand why. And the Holy Spirit told me it's because these are the people that you hate. And even in the way that you speak to people, you show that you don't love them. And so I decided to give this up to God. And I was like, you know, God, I'm good now. But God did something interesting to me um, last year. Last year, I got a job at this place called Securitas at the uh, head office, where basically we're doing after hours managerial work. That part doesn't even really matter. But Regardless, the point is, I came into a workplace where almost every single female employee that I was working with was homosexual. Almost every, like my boss, my boss's boss, my supervisor, everybody. And at this point, I think I've already dealt with my problem, right? And what happened is, I started coming to a point where I didn't treat them differently, I didn't look at them differently, and I was able to be kind and actually love them. And one day, I have a friend, I'm not going to tell you what her name is, God willing, one day she'll come to church. And she asked me for a ride home, and she was uh, a homosexual as well. And during the ride, you know, I'm, I'm driving her home, and she goes, um, Daniel, I need you to stop at McDonald's. I need to pick up a double, what, a big double from my boo. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of just look for it. <laughs> and she's like, why do you always get weird whenever I talk about my girlfriend? And I was like, honestly, I'm driving to McDonald's. I don't know what you're from I was like, I was like, honestly, I'm going there, you know, let's leave it at that. And she was like, no, no, no. <laughs> I want to know, why is it you always get this way whenever I bring up my girlfriend? And I was like, you know what, I don't know if you want to have this conversation. <laughs> and she was like, well, I know that you're a Christian, and pay, pay attention to this part, because this part really struck me. She said, I know that you're a Christian, and I want to ask from a Christian's point of view what you think about what I'm doing. Because I know that you won't tell me something crazy like you think that we should just die. <laughs> and the crazy thing is, she didn't know where I came from. She didn't know the way that God had transformed me. The, God, the way that God had made me into a new person. And so she was willing to listen to the gospel after she understood that she wasn't looking at someone who was there to judge her, but someone that loved her. Even though she knew I wasn't in agreement with her lifestyle. 
and I warned her, I said, if I speak, I'm going to offend you. And she said, well, go ahead and speak then. <laughs> and we basically, we got into it. We got into it. Now, <laughs> we turn to verse 17 in Jonah. Flipping around a lot. Jonah 1. And this is the last way that I felt myself running. So, we're at the point now where the men have thrown Jonah, have thrown Jonah off of the boat. And the Bible says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then the whole of verse 2, we're able, or chapter 2, we're able to see Jonah's prayer as he was cast into the sea. And you know what? We're actually going to read. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he heard me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings. Moorings means the foundations or the bases. I went down to the foundations of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought me up. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. While Jonah was sinking in the sea, And we hear he got all the way down to the foundations of the mountains. That's deep. It's a miracle that he even lasted in the sea that long. Yet Jonah didn't know God had already prepared a fish. Many of us right now may be sinking. Sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. Sinking in a way that all we see is our death is imminent before us. Sinking in a way that every time the pastor says, how many of you believe that you are saved? We get stressed. Sinking in a way that we're unsure of our own salvation. But we just have to do like Jonah. And to remember the Lord. And to gaze our eyes back up to Christ. And immediately, he will have saved us. Why? Because God is waiting for your prayer. Salvation is easy. Turn to your neighbor and tell them salvation is easy. <laughs> salvation is easy, easy, easy. Salvation is easy. It's not meant to be difficult. You don't have to memorize the Bible first. You don't have to understand everything first. Jonah was a prophet and he still didn't understand everything. Salvation is the moment when you decide to give yourself to Christ. Salvation is the moment that you decide to make that decision for Him. And instead of thinking about your own works, what you're supposed to do, what you can do, focus on what Jesus did. Because Jesus did all the doing that there could be done. Jesus
Jesus died for your death. He suffered for your punishment. He rose again for your justification. So that there would be no more work for you to accomplish, but just to accept a free gift of His grace. And so, let's not be discouraged in thinking that we have to clean ourselves up first. Because the first thing that we need to do is come to God and He will do the rest. Even after the Lord had called me, and I was sure that He called me. I don't have to get into details to explain why I knew the Lord called me into ministry. Because I know that the Lord called me into ministry. And even after He called me, I still wanted to do it my own way. I still said to myself, uh, you know, $20,000 a year, <laughs> I don't have that kind of money. Um, what way can I work around this to make this make sense in terms of my wallet? Because I didn't have that much money, and I still don't. I even have less than I had before. <laughs> so, I said to myself, hmm, well, I used to want to be a soldier, so if I join the army, oh, you see Richard, Richard looking at me like, oh, you found out too? <laughs> I, said, I said to myself, if I join the army, they'll pay for my education for me, I'll get to be a chaplain for a few years, and then I'll be able to be a pastor and branch out and do what God told me. I said, hey, hey, let's go, Daniel. You know? I'm hiding. And I got to the enrollment office for, you know, the military. I made sure it stuck on my chest. <laughs> you know? I said, Hello, sir. This guy had a strong grip, you know. <laughs> and uh, I told him I wanted to join the Navy. I thought about this a lot because I said, you know what? I don't want to have to actually go shoot somebody. So let me just join the Navy, you know, mop the boat. <laughs> you know, they'll be at war, I'll be like, oh, oh. <laughs> Gotta make sure the floor's clean, you can't slip. <laughs> I didn't want to be one of those guys with the joystick, and you, like blow up a whole city, like. <laughs> so I just enrolled for the, for the role where you just tie up ropes and, <laughs> and clean stuff and stuff like that. And um, they told me, yeah, yeah, you know, everything's good. All you need to do is take an aptitude test. Now, the aptitude test just meant you had to have a grade, le uh, grade 10 level of competency. Understand, right? So as long as I was at a grade 10 level, I'd be able to join. I was like, okay, that's easy. <laughs> that's not a problem. Because I already went to university at this time. So I wasn't scared about that. But something that I've always prayed was, Lord, if I'm doing anything that's not your will, stop it. If I'm doing anything that's not your will, Lord, do not allow it to work. I would encourage you to pray this prayer, but I'm going to let you know it's frustrating. <laughs> because I tried to do a lot of things. I tried to duck and dive, you know, and I tried to do real estate, to be a licensed life insurance broker, to have my own business. Like I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried, but for some reason, stuff just wasn't working. And now when I feel like I'm actually doing what God told me to do, but I'm doing it my own way, God told me that's not the way as well. So all I have to do is take this test. And every time it comes time for me to take the test, Something goes wrong. And I want you to understand that the military is super, super, super organized. Like crazy, crazy organized. So seven times I had my appointment rescheduled. I would come down, they'd tell me, oh, we broke down the room, so we have a new room that we're building somewhere else. So we're going to have to push you down to next month. And I was like, what? Like, how does this stuff happen? And every time, to the point that it was getting so bad, they were sending me home so much 
that they started offering me gas money. <laughs> I'm not even lying. I'm not, I wish I was lying. They're like, oh, man, you know, how much gas did you pay, man? How so now finally, on the seventh time I went there, finally, you know, I'm sitting down, I'm waiting, like, okay, something's gonna go wrong. And they're like, no, everybody come in, it's time to take the test. And they had six computers lined up, boom, 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 boom. And uh, like five people are sitting down, we all have our little cubicles ready to take the test. And one by one, everybody loads up the computer with their login, etc., and they're taking the test. And I'm kind of like, You know, the military guy was like, is there a problem? And I was like, oh no, I haven't. I... <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm just like, what is wrong with my computer? Like, I don't, I'm, just like, I'm looking at the sheet like, is this the right sheet? Is, is my name Daniel? And it's said right. What is going on here? To the point that the man got up like, what's wrong with you? Are you in hot? Oh Lord, please. Lord, please. <laughs> Everybody's ready to test my thing won't load up. So he comes on. He's like, move, move. <laughs> He's like. <laughs> He's like and eventually he got up. He was like, okay, okay, no. It seems like uh, it seems like there's a problem with the computer. And I was like, oh, okay. So we went to his computer. It wasn't working there either. And he went to every computer that was inside the base. None of them would load up my name. While everybody is taking a simple task, none of them would load up my name. And I'm here like, can't you just print it out? And I'm like, you know, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> I said, all right, all right, fine, fine, that's cool. So none of them would load up my name. And when I left, I just heard God telling me, I didn't tell you to join the military. I told you to preach my word. And I said, Lord, I don't have $20,000. Matter of fact, I wish I had $10,000 or $5,000. But, um, if this is what you want me to do, then I'll do it. 25 years old now, and this is my first year at school. And I praise God for it. Because the instant that I stopped trying to figure out the smartest way to do something, that I stopped trying to figure out the best way it was for me to do something, and the instant that I just did what God told me to do, all I've been doing since I've come here is witnessing God open up the doors for me. Amen. No matter what it is, no matter if it was my luggage needing to come up here, no matter if it was my ticket on the Greyhound, whatever the case may be, God worked out absolutely everything for me. Because the thing that we need to understand, church, is that the role that God is calling to you the road that God is calling you to is not a road that he's leaving you to go do on your own. It's a road that he's walked for you. It's a road that he's paved for you. It's a road that he's prepared for you. So even when there's difficulties, even when you feel like you've just been thrown over the boat, God has already prepared the fish for you. Because as long as you submit yourself to his will, he will accomplish it through you and for you. So if there's anyone here today that's tired of doing things their own way, that's tired of living life the way that they think that they should live it, that's tired of the, um, let me just have fun, that wants to give up what they've been doing, and to take up their cross and follow Jesus Christ. I would just ask that you stand.
Don't stand because the person next to you is standing. Consider. At this moment, I'm going to ask that each of us grab someone beside you who you didn't come with. And I ask that you pray with them. First of all, I want you to ask each other, what is it that you want me to pray for you for? And I want you to pray with them. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Heavenly Father, I know that you're hearing our prayers today. And I know that there is rejoicing in heaven today. Because I know that your spirit has moved in this place. Because you promised in your word, dear Heavenly Father, that your spirit would lead us into all truth. And at this moment, dear Heavenly Father, there's many people who are suffering Many people who are lacking faith, O oh Lord, who are lacking the belief to believe that they can actually change, to believe that they can actually walk in a new direction, to believe that they can actually be pleasing to you. But I ask their Heavenly Father that you remind them that you said, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because we don't go into your labor, O oh Lord, we go into your rest. So today in your day of rest, O oh Lord, help us to remember that you placed man in a garden that he didn't plant. That you gave him dominion over creatures that man did not create. Heavenly Father, that you gave him a woman when man was sat in the garden. The same way, O oh Heavenly Father, that you longed for us when we weren't yet created. Man longed for a partner. And so your church is more to you, O oh Lord, than what we can ever imagine. Your love for us, O oh Heavenly Father, is the only reason why we can be saved. Because if the truth be told, O oh Lord, none of us are worthy. None of us, O oh Lord, are righteous of ourselves. None of us, O oh Lord, have actually done good. Even our good deeds are as filthy rags before you. And all we do when we come to you, Heavenly Father, is we ask that you don't look at us according to ourselves. Lord, that you don't remember us according to our works, but you remember us according to the work of Jesus Christ. That you don't look at my clothes of righteousness because they're filthy and they're filled with holes, O oh Lord God, and they're not good enough to come before you. But that Jesus Christ would cover us with his blood. Because it's by his blood that we are saved. Heavenly Father, I ask at this moment if anyone in their heart would say, Lord, I surrender myself to you. Lord, I give myself to you. Lord, I'm tired of living my own way. Lord, I need to stop being racist. Lord, I need to stop being sexist. Lord, I need to stop oppressing your people. Lord, I need to forgive somebody that you would free them of their chains, oh Heavenly Father God. That you would help them to worship you in spirit and in truth, O oh Lord. And that you would let them know that he who is freed by the Son is freed indeed. We thank you for your peace, O oh Lord. We thank you for your salvation. Because it's a free gift that you've given all of us. So help those who are struggling now to accept that salvation. And none other than the name which is above every name. Jesus Christ, we 